You're listening to The Kylo Show, the podcast where we talk about how to keep your love on no matter what and why whole healthy families are going to save the world. And it starts right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Kylo Show. You may have noticed we have something a little different going on. We have a guest with us who is someone we love and joining us is Bernie Godwin. Bernie, good morning. Hello. Good, good morning. morning from the Gold Coast area. With Gold Coast Australia. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm halfway between Gold Coast and Brisbane. There you go. That's what I meant. Like area. <laughs> kind of like... <laughs> wow and uh you got like a seven hour time difference it's 10 a.m here so good morning (laughs) yeah good morning it's 3 a.m here oh geez that is this dedication here it is dedication well thanks so much again for getting up that early and then looking beautiful on top of that you know you're 3 a.m. rolling out of bed. No, you are ready to shine. Oh, no, she's doing she's it. She's show ready at 3 a.m. <laughs> which is uh, this awesome. is how I wake up. So <laughs> Thank good. you for inviting me. So good. <laughs> well, Bernie, um, she has been running with Loving on Purpose for how long now? Has it been uh, over 15 years? All up? At least 15 years since you since I first met you. And then you kind of, you yep. kept moving closer and closer and closer. And finally, you're kind of in our inner realm, kind of our, well, you are one of our certified loving on purpose coaches and you are um, just our rep in Australia and, uh, and really mm-hmm. in the education world at, at this point where we are uh, watching you put together your first book. That's right. uh, Bring out loving our students on purpose. Loving our students on purpose. And um, so even with that title indicates that we have combined forces (laughs) and Bernie and Danny have um, mainly Bernie has produced this beautiful instruction manual for uh, bringing a culture of honor to your classroom in just a, I don't know, well, I, don't, I, I don't know if you would say it that way, but I would That's say right. it that way. Yeah. So what is it that you do yeah. to, um, for loving your students on purpose? Like, how did you, what do you do for a living? Because nobody knows what you do. Please tell us, tell us what you do that makes you so qualified <laughs> to help all these people with their students. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a school social worker here in Australia. I work um, predominantly Um, in alternative education at the moment, but through a range of schools, private, public um, schools. And the main role has been to work one-on-one with students to help them process behavior and well-being. But in the process, I found that I connected with so many parents and we started to run Loving Our Kids on Purpose for the parents who were really interested because they were noticing changes in their kids. And from there, the teachers got involved and went, what's going on? And When the kids come to you, they like it, there's change, there's growth. And so they are starting to ask us to come into the classrooms and give advice. So now I'm a consultant to schools. Principals call me in for advice on well-being and behavior. um, And it's an opportunity to go and give training to all the staff as well. The main goal is to shift the paradigm of punishment in schools towards love and connection that sets students up to want to learn in a really safe environment. That feels like a school I'd want to go to. Yeah, or at least I'd be sending my kids to. For yep. Sure. yep, that was a school I would have needed back in the day. <laughs> Fantastic. So it's the school that a lot of kids need today. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And Bernie, you and I met um, <clears throat> while you were a school social worker. And uh, well, we met in Australia, I should say. I, I came to Australia. You had invited uh, Sherry and I over there. And uh, I mm-hmm. got to see you in action. And you were just fantastic. And and uh, you you were famous amongst your team for being kind of the, uh, the kid whisperer. 
you you would uh i don't know if that makes any sense in australia or not but um you know you seem to have <laughs> yeah. the, the the art of of lowering anxiety in students that were just so jacked up from uh life's abuses and uh mm -hmm. trying so hard to deal with school and the demands and uh, going to a place every day where they were set up for failure and they knew they were going to fail. And yet you mm -hmm. seem to be able to reach in there and invite them into trusting someone enough to lead them. And that's really Yeah, my team calls it the truth serum. The truth serum. There you go. <laughs> there you go. You were, you were the, the, uh, you were hosting a safe place for them to to step into and um, learn to make an attachment, learn to um, risk and and even clean up messes. How'd you do that? I think in schools, it's really important to remember that you're never just working with a student. It's a really complex network of systems and relationships. And so, um every day it's working with the parent the teachers for and they don't just have one teacher they have multiple teachers covering lots of subjects and the leadership team and the behavior and the well-being and so there's this complex web of relationships that you're holding that rope-like tension with so that you can pull on it at any one time and when the students realize that we're on their team we want to see them succeed and we're going in to meet the need and like you said we're lowering anxiety we're providing an opportunity for them to show up and i'm equally showing up I, there's an expectation on my part that there's some responsibility that they're going to carry in this relationship suddenly we start to see students just come alive and it's not that they don't make mistakes it's actually that we want to create opportunities to make mistakes because on that edge of the mistake making is where the heavy life-changing character learning is going to happen and so when you're working we start with them at around four years old all the way through to 18 and you're taking them on this 13 year journey where they're going to constantly make mistakes but there's not always going to be the same mistake for a while and for a teacher and for a parent it looks like they always make the same mistake over and over again but actually we're starting to see them grow in the way they apply themselves and the mistakes are actually evolving and changing. So what might look like a four-year-old running away from class might look like a teenager dealing with social anxiety. And so we're, we're walking them through the journey of how can we help them with what their need is today and let them be known and seen and valued. And we used to use the phrase, we are beloved, chosen and cherished. And I particularly like to cherish someone is to, to look after them and think about them when they're not present to set up that environment. So safety is super important. It's not about removing the threat. It's about um, creating opportunity for the child to know or the teacher to know that they can manage the threat. That's what gives them the confidence to stay safe no matter what's going on in that environment. Because schools are very unsafe. People are looking at you. There's opportunities to fail, but there's these norms that happen at home, we're allowed to go to the toilet whenever we want at home. Or if you're in another room, you have to call out and acknowledge your parent. Try doing that in a classroom with 30 kids and you know, you're know you busted and you're getting in trouble. So it's a lot of it is learning what's appropriate to the context of school as well. So yeah, it's really about building that trust and lowering the anxiety so that it's a safe environment. Because as soon as the students are feeling safe, they're engaging in their learning. And that's what we want to see. We want to see the academic results as well. That's got to be so helpful to have unpacked, to be able to give to your teachers. Yeah. Because I mean, I have three children and I've homeschooled them. And so just three kids alone, let alone 30 kids in one classroom and they're not mine. I mean, that's a lot yeah. of undertaking. And I always am admiring teachers, grace and patience, but you know, you get three mm -hmm. kids in there that are, you know, have some behavioral stuff or have some needs that are being expressed in poor behavior choices. Uh, I, I feel mm -hmm. overwhelmed and I don't know how to be successful as a teacher. So how have you been able to, you know, give this gift that you've discovered and captured to your teachers and empowering them? 
Yeah, well, learning the Loving Our Kids on Purpose course was a huge part of that for me. So I just kind of soaked in that for so long, it became second language. And I realized that when, you know, Danny is talking about, or you're now talking about powerful people, we're also talking about powerful teachers. And a huge part of the piece for whether they're teachers or teacher aides or the canteen groundsmen, admin, it doesn't really matter. If they don't feel powerful, then they're not bringing their best self. And when you've got 30 students in your room looking back at you, if you're not bringing your best self, they're not either. They're reflecting you. And so a huge part of this process is taking the teachers or the educators on a journey of figuring out who they are, how strong they are in their character, building that up, helping them become powerful teachers so that they can manage them no matter what's happening in front of them. Because things are going to happen. You, know, you get a four-year-old or a 15-year-old with life things and complex issues or just a bad you know, hormone day and things are just going to start to explode. And if you don't know what you're going to do with you, if you don't have a plan, then it's going to keep unfolding in a negative way. And I think in our schools, we're so focused sometimes on compliance and getting the kids just to perform that we're not creating those safe opportunities for character development. And that really starts with us as the adults to role model to the kids. I love that. I, I feel like it's a uh, character development and teachers. Oh, what a thought. <laughs> this, this feels like uh, we're teaching everybody to Kylo five right yeah. here. Oh, that's, top that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and every teacher. single one of these kids in our school has a, has a parent as well. And some of our parents are doing an amazing job and some of the parents are struggling. So for a lot of these kids coming to school can be the safest place in their life. They want to be at school, but this is now an opportunity where we're either for those parents who are already doing a great job with the Kylo 5, they're getting a double dose in those kids. But for those who aren't getting at home, we can create opportunities for them to get it somewhere else as well. And I just find that exciting because these kids in our room, they're going to be the ones making future policy decisions, leadership decisions. They're going to be bosses. They're going to be parents and they're going to be in our community. So what kind of community are we growing? And one that has the Kylo 5 built into it and connection and love, that's what I'm going after. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, this is the Kylo 5 with brain science. <laughs> <laughs> and, and education yes. model. And yes. All of the things in there. We are Bernie just gets into the understanding of how environment affects brain functioning affects child relationships parent teacher relationship and um uh, i i think that maybe bernie i don't i, don't, I mean I, I know you get pretty technical in your book but you have brain scientists excited about your book i've seen some of the endorsements that are coming in talk a little bit about that that's right yeah, so part of my background is I studied neuropsychotherapy so that I could understand what was going on for our students. And for me, the first part of the book is around understanding the applied neuroscience of connection. And so breaking down how does connection work um, neurologically and physiologically so that we understand what's going on for our students. It's really a filter. Um, and for those who are very scientific, there's a few chapters that goes deep. And for those who don't want to go that deep, you know, there's some great stories in there to show how you apply it in your everyday school environment. What's been exciting is seeing some pretty um, incredible names, Professor Borges and, and John Arden and Louis Costolino. They've come alongside and provided a lot of support in writing those chapters, including Margaret Nagib as well. And just to see the joy and the excitement in the neuroscience community that our teachers are going to have access to a, another way, a different way. And so, so much of our policies in school is actually based on our crime and punishment regimes. It's, you know, we have isolation, we have punishment, we have um, the merit points, all the things that we have as adults for punishment are actually things that we just came out of our school systems as well. And so to have an, a book that's suggesting that, you know, yes, punishment works, 
you get quick results, but you don't create character. And then here's a way to go about building character in that slow process of neural development at age appropriate levels across the lifespan. And so we try to look at the different stages of development, the ages that the children are at, and how you can apply it to filter what you're seeing in the classroom, because every situation is so unique. And so it's a filter. So the first part of the book is the filters through the neuroscience lens. And then the second part of that book is the tools to apply once you have looked into what's going on. And so we aren't looking at the, the faith lens like you do in a lot of your books. We've used the science lens because we want it to be a book for any school anywhere in the world. It's not specific to Australia. It's just written for any classroom desk in the whole world. Mm -hmm. It just might have the word color spelled differently. Yeah, in color, the US honor, and honor. Uh, favor. <laughs> That's what I learned. Yeah, all that, all that. That's, yeah. There's a few words. <laughs> yeah, we've used, the Amer we've used the American. Oh, there you go. Thanks for catering to our very we take stubborn. You out of honor. We take the you out of favor. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure why we do that. I don't either, yeah. but uh, we probably should dive into the brain science of that. We've done something. I, I, I just in, in your description there, I, I, when I heard you say that, you know, we get so much of our school system from societal punishment paradigm mm -hmm. but uh, but at the same time we then train children really well in societal's punishment paradigm and yeah. we do actually end up with character but we don't end up with a character that protects connection we end up with the character right. that protects mm -hmm. ourselves yeah. and so we end up yes, more distance. orphaned in our in our in our spirit yeah. than we end up familial or family in our uh, covenant context. And I think that is something that is gonna, which is what I watched you do at the school was you built this ginormous team at the school where everybody began to think in terms of community and connection and relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just the student and the teacher, it began to be the whole staffing team the administration, yep. and then the parents began to watch their children mm -hmm. come home from that environment and say, well, what is happening over there? So when we showed up and did a parenting thing, there was this big connect between, oh, if I make these changes at home, I'll get the same child at home that you guys are getting at school. That's right. Yeah. One of my favorite examples was the first um, Loving Our Kids on Purpose course that we ran. And we had this dad come along to the course. We actually had two different dads. So this first dad, he came along and his son was probably around seven at the time. So I think grade one kind of age. And at the end of the course, we would give them an opportunity every night to share. And the last night he he got up in front of the group and he he cried the whole time he was sharing with us. He said, my son used to be at school in trouble all the time and I didn't understand it. And now um, when he walks past me at home, instead of turning his back away from me so I didn't hit him, he was running into my arms and hugging me. And he says, it's just mm. changed our relationship. Mm. And that was that time I'm like, what we do at school is changing families. And then the second dad, he was a dad of a high school student and he was the manager of a local shopping center. Um, and so he came to the course because he said, the kids we hired from your school were different. And I wanted to know what you were doing with your students in high school because they were so different. And then at the end of the course, he's like, I'm gonna start running them this course with my team because they hire a lot of teenagers in, in that particular shopping complex. So like it started to really help me see this is not, like it, it started with me just doing my work with the students in front of me. And from there, I just started to see this has got a ripple effect into our community. And what if we could shift our entire country paradigm away from punishment and control and towards connection and love in a healthy context and family context as well? Yeah. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, you're pioneering in that for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So fun to watch. I just, I'm curious as to, I mean, I know that how you kind of met up um, and found loving your kids on purpose, but, you know, why did you choose it? Like, what was the, what was, 
pulling you in because obviously you're working in the school system. So you've been getting, I'm guessing you're seeing a problem and you are solving it. So how did you even decide this is the route we're going to go? Like, what was the light switch that went on that you're like, oh, this is, this is what's going to change it. I'd say the first time I started to think about schools, maybe needing some change was when I was a student and internally I was a really well-behaved student I got really good marks but something just didn't seem right I was watching students around me struggling and being expelled or going through massive life crises and not having support and it got me really curious about what could be done differently when I left school I I even though I was a good student I hated school and I was never going to go back into a school environment and I, I totally failed uni. I was sitting on the couch, not knowing what to do with my life. And I just got this phone call from a parent saying, could you tutor my daughter and her friend? They'd gotten in big trouble at school. And I didn't really think much of it. I'm like, they're, they're just kids a couple of years younger than me. Why not give it a go? And very quickly, I learned that homeschooling is a very difficult gig. Like these were hurting students, they'd been rejected from their peers, they disappointed their parents, they were banned from school for 10 weeks. I don't think that's even legal anymore, but they were hurting. And I came in going, here's your timetable, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, a good little teacher, my mum was a teacher, I learned how to, you know, follow all that. And they just rebelled. All my rules did not work. And they were on their phone texting boys and rude and I was like I don't know what I'm gonna do and I literally <laughs> rang their mum and said I quit I got in my car and I left and I was like, I'm not going back to that place and that mum rang me and said no I believe in you and I really want you to give it another shot and wow. that was the first time where I took a risk and exposed my heart and said look this is what I'm experiencing I don't know what you need tell me what you need and together we just made this plan that worked and they they passed they went back to school and and the coolest part is that was the first student i ever worked with this year she qualified as a social worker in a school and she's just you know amazing to see the massive journey she's been on that's been 20 odd years but that was the first time i saw there was a problem in me and that I was like yellow trucking and trying to dominate and control and thought that I could control this teenage girls and it was just a lie it was never going to happen and then after that uh, this school contacted me and I, I worked for the school for a little while and then I went into alternative education and we had this tiny program of 10 kids that all had been expelled so we morning we had 10 and afternoon we had 10 and we only had expelled students. And the teacher I worked with there showed me the Loving Our Kids on Purpose program. And I think just naturally, because I was so new, it was my first year out of uni graduating at that point. I was just copying, but it worked. And these students went from never attending school to being expelled to 100% attendance and engaging in their learning. And that was the big flag for me. Something right was happening here. Um, mm -hmm. And it's still, I worked in a few schools after that before I landed in the, the larger school where we used this on you know, mass scale. But by then it was natural language. And I just yeah. did it because that's what came, the wording came, the one-liners, just not yellow trucking, managing myself well. And the, the teachers started to notice there was two reactions. The teachers either yelled at me because how dare the child behave for you and not me, or they got curious and they started to come and ask questions. And so slowly it just started to catch on and, and we started to run Loving Our Kids on Purpose, not realizing it would slowly evolve into loving our students on purpose and something that we could teach directly into the context of schools. Mm -hmm. I love that. I hear that you had such a heart and passion for it um, on your own this desire for connection, this desire for um, understanding like you did with those girls. And, and then you came across a tool yeah. that was able to help you just put what was already naturally in you to another level. And then you've taken it to another level. So that's, a, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that backstory and congratulations to this young woman who's now 
I mean, she's kind of mm-hmm. following her her mentor and yep. and her footsteps a yep. little bit. I mean, if you think about that, she wanted to be you when she grew up, <laughs> which is so great. That's beautiful. It's pretty cute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You no, know, I I think about the education landscape these days, and uh, you know, at least in the United States, it, it it does feel like there's a a bit of a a war, a culture war going on between homes and schools and and many parents mm-hmm. have uh, you know kind of set up with the global shutdown that you couldn't you couldn't send your kids to school without it being a, a giant deal so so many parents are either taking the responsibility on themselves to steward the education that they want their children to have or they've kind of pooled up in solidarity in different places to uh, either build a school or to uh, be very, very responsible investigating where their child will go to school. Uh, This book feels like it would be such a valuable tool to either establishing a foundation or helping to perpetuate a culture that is very much around centered around building character, personal responsibility, forming strong, lasting attachments and relationships, uh, helping yeah. children become problem solvers and able to handle the real life challenges of life and not just uh, these kind of f- false like somebody's going to actually protect you from all these hard times out there and remove all your obstacles. What, what do you think about that? Do you think this is a, be a, um, a good place to start? Yeah. I think that one of the mistakes we can make is removing obstacles from students. You know, their learning is going to be on the edges of uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily want them to stay on the edges. We want them to rebound to joy. But it's actually okay for them to go to the edges of their learning and be a little bit uncomfortable and figure out problems for themselves and giving them the strategies and the tools. As adults, we get to come alongside them and help them repair relationships, help them to clean up their messes and guide that process, but we're not there to take them away. And and so often we are taking away the problems for kids and they're not learning how to resolve it. And these adults then grow up and they don't know how to manage conflict in their home or they're not sure how to even have um, the skills to speak up to their boss appropriately. And we want to make sure that they have slowly, incrementally, with our support and guidance, learned how to handle a little bit of stress in their lives, a little bit of healthy uncomfortability. Now, stress is a positive thing when it's helping a student to prepare for an exam, but it's an unhealthy thing when it becomes perfectionism and they've shut down because they're too afraid to achieve. And so it's helping the parents and helping the teachers to understand what's going on developmentally for their child and what's necessary to help their child. So I I definitely think that this is a great platform for that. And one of the things we cover in the book is what's age appropriate for young people as and what's normal. Sometimes we try to put our paradigm of normal as an adult onto a child and there's so many elements of school that we've forgotten. And one of the things that stood out to me for the last 20 years in school is the patterns and seeing the very predictable patterns that happen in a a term cycle here in Australia, that 10 week term cycles and also a year cycle and then also the 13 year journey cycle. So so understanding the patterns can be so relieving if I say to a parent, um, you know, this is what's going on for your child. They're having these really big conflict issues right now. It's grade nine. It's one of the worst. Parents think they're never going to survive. But then I can say to them, well, in grade 11, well, that girl is going to happen again. And they're all shocked. And then I get a phone call from them in grade, grade 11 saying, oh, my gosh, you said this was going to happen. And it did. And I know it will be OK. And we get to insert hope just by telling them what's going on so that they don't have to be guessing. And so much of the time, I think we're taken by surprise by things that shouldn't be a surprise. Yeah. That's parenting, for sure. For sure. <laughs> Just expect it I all the time. I They're going to keep doing this it. already. I thought we yeah. put this in the bag and it's out of the bag again. We just completed year 11 <laughs> with our oldest. And 
I knew that it was going to be a hard year. I knew that sixth grade was going to be a hard year, which our next one down, Addie just finished. So I'm like, okay, both of you are in really hard years right now, which yeah. is so much fun. I'm so glad we did this <laughs> at the same time. Good timing. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, watching I the, the struggle, you know, obviously we love and value all the same concept and um, principles and loving your kids on purpose. You've taken to education. I've naturally just kind of leaned into that with our homeschooling and with just the schools that we've picked. And I'm really thankful for the school that the mm -hmm. kids are at now because they have, um, they don't, they're just now getting some of our resources because we are part of the school and I'm excited to give them your book uh, just to plant some more That's seeds exciting. in there of yeah. what I love. Um, but it is, you know, that removing the learning experience uh, of, and, you know, them not having struggle is, it's not setting them up for success. So I, 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 there is a dance for sure. There's that little dance, like you said, that we want them on the edge, but we want them to return to joy. Um, you know, yes. watching Delaney for her first time, get a review back for her first job. You know, it's not the review she wanted, mm -hmm. but because, you know, we've walked through lots of, you know, hard times, struggle, Feedback. What are you going to do about that? What do you want to do about that? And we've had these discussions in school yeah. and I would say that she's much more motivated, motivated with work than she is with school, but <laughs> Hey, it's okay. You know, <laughs> when we take it where, but, um, it is, I, I, I love it. I love so much that you're out there doing this, um, you know, on the other side of the planet, hopefully we'll meet in the middle and consume the whole planet. Okay, Bernie, that's the goal. Is that I'll, I'll meet you on that's the my other goal. side. So we'll just keep, keep going. We'll just keep walking yeah. um, till we cover the whole planet, but it's so good. So speaking of goals, yeah. um, Bernie, I mean, if you had a, a, a wish come true, what would you want to see happen in every school? Imagine a school community where the students, the parents, and the teachers are happy to take responsibility for their own choices and their actions because they've mastered connection. Like that is my ultimate goal. I, I call it joyful responsibility. It's that I am happy to take responsibility for this mess that I've made and I'm happy to go clean it up. And whether it's a teacher frustrated with a conflict with a parent or a leadership frustrated with a teacher. It's how do we do this well? How do we keep connection and keep our joy on in the mess? And I think for me, that would be that that um, environment to work in would just be an amazing one. And I want to see that across the whole world. Schools that are ready to pursue connection, pursue love and relationship and and that doesn't mean a free for all that there's no boundaries, which I think often gets misunderstood. It's about keeping that tension between responsibility and rules and connection and relationship. And when you get that tension right, you're going to have responsible, respectful interactions with young people, and they can handle higher levels of responsibility when that happens. Beautiful. She sounds like us. <laughs> she, that's what I said. We're just going to take over the whole planet. I'm so glad she's on the other side. We're just going to do it. Families <laughs> and schools are uh -huh. going to change the world. Yeah, and that is so good. I, again, more than ever. This so class, every kid has a parent and a teacher. Yep. And, and that's what I was going to say. I've, we've learned that in the school that our kids are in is that um, when there's a partnership between the parent and the school, the biggest person that wins is student, yeah. which is, you know, Absolutely. obviously as a parent, yeah. I want my child to win. And as mm -hmm. educators, you want the child to win, but we often are not on the same yep. page. So that's what I see you is really mm -hmm. just this advocate for parents and educators coming together to see the child win. And, and that's mm -hmm. what I keep hearing um, as you're describing and, and what you're chasing after. So I'm so excited about that, which you have to tell me if you, your book, who is it for? Like, who, who do you want to be purchasing your book? I want my book to be purchased, particularly by the frustrated teachers, you know, the wary parents and those disillusioned, discouraged leaders. It's 
for everybody who's in a school environment. It, you know, the story is about the front reception, the story is about, you know, the teacher aides, the teachers, it's, it's a whole network that comes around a student, like is it's the parent, it's the leader, it's the teacher, it's for everybody. And it hasn't been written uniquely for teaching. It's not a pedagogy book. It's around how do we keep our love on? And how do we break this idea that behavior management is the way to go? because we can't manage someone's behavior. What we can do is set up great classroom structures and we can do behavior education and we can educate young people on how they're gonna manage themselves and we educate ourselves. And it really is a self journey for the person reading the book. It's less about the kid and a lot more about how we manage ourselves so that the student learns from our example and from our words and role model. Mm -hmm. So good. That is so good. So good. I mean, it, it for whatever reason, it seems like, uh, there's such an emphasis on sex education as though sex was like some kind of goal in life. When you're like, <laughs> we got to teach these kids to have great sex or whole life instead of character. Like, no, no, no. Character is going to take you way farther than great sex is. And it's going to cause, you know, way less tr trouble yeah. if you emphasize character instead of sex. Uh, I don't know what yeah. happened, but we we've moved our our entire priority system away from responsibility, respect, relationship, connection to selfish indulgence and pleasure that somebody else is responsible for the consequences mm -hmm. that all that causes. So way to go, Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you. We actually need this book more than ever. So timely. Mm -hmm. Uh, and mm -hmm. administrators, you, you know, if you're listening to this or you know an administrator, somebody who's in charge of creating culture for schools, mm -hmm. you've got to get this book. Um, yeah. Teachers, yeah. absolutely. Teachers are creating culture in, in every, even subcultures. I mean, maybe you're in a, a, mm -hmm. a dysfunctional culture, but you have the power to create a subculture that can be very powerful and in fact, impactful on kids. Yeah. I even think about my, um, our kids, youth pastors and youth leaders that are just, you know, yes. working so closely with, uh, parents, you know, uh, Adeline just recently had her first kind of lunch with a youth pastor or youth leader and she was nervous about it. And I'm like, honey, this is what they do. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. This is, this is step one of entering youth group. And, um, but what yeah. I love is obviously our role is uh, a bit louder maybe than some parents, but they're very much like, what do you need from us? How can we help you? What's better language we should use? And so I, I think this is probably a great resource to, um, a, a school that may be connected to a church or, um, just different, mm -hmm. maybe parents that have a, a, a leader that's in their child's life that they could say, Hey, this is what we're doing. Keep helping us. Um, and here's some language and, you know, I, I think that's probably another really great market is youth leaders that are helping these kids be successful. Yeah. I mean, anyone working with children, I'll be doing some training for a, a kindergarten and they're wanting the same principles to work with the teeny tiny little ones. And so, yeah, schools, churches, but also like scout groups and, and other groups where kids are involved. And for parents, it's, I think this is a really timely book for parents to understand what's going on for their student. When their kid goes to school, they're still involved. And one of the mistakes we make as parents is they get to high school, and we step back and we think, oh, we don't need to be involved yep. anymore there in high school. But actually, that's when we want them to step forward. And a parent that steps forward mm -hmm. when they get it to that high school level is going to see some beautiful outcomes when their child graduates. So I think it is a timely book. Teachers are leaving the profession at too fast a rate at the moment. They're disillusioned and frustrated. And so this book is designed to insert hope into the classroom, into their profession and into themselves that they can actually handle what's going on in their classrooms because now they have some tools that they can apply. Okay, well, on that note, where do they get this book, Bernie? Where can they find the hope? Uh, it's going to be released on Amazon very soon. Okay. Very soon on Amazon. That's, that's yeah. where you're going to go and find it. Yeah. And it'll be available on lovingonpurpose.com and it'll be available and we'll keep communicating all the places where you can get access to this thing. So very soon, 
yep. let's say by fall or the end of the summer for us, the end of the winter for you. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> We're in different Office seasons. The the it's the goal. Yeah. I mean, the goal is August at the moment. Okay, great. Well, that's perfect because I don't know about your school uh, timing, but August tip it typically is when all the students are going back to school here. I know that you guys have a different system than we do yeah. um, only because I'm married to an Aussie. So I know more about this than I would, <laughs> but um, you guys have your breaks. I think you're, I don't know if you're headed back by then, but that's, if you know an educator and you're looking for a great gift, this would be it. Definitely. Yeah. Great way to start the year. Yes, I agree. Well, Bernie, thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you so much for really releasing hope to educators because we, we need them to be invested in our kids and in our family and champions for these young people that are going to be the, the future leaders. So you are, are helping other people like you in the field of education and parents feel encouraged that and hopeful again you use the word hope but i think that is very accurate to what you're doing is releasing hope back again into something that can be um a beautiful partnership yeah and and it, mm -hmm. and it literally puts legs to whole healthy families are going to save the world i mean it's it's literally going to impact communities yeah which is awesome again yeah. thanks so much well everything joining. we've learned is from you denny <laughs> well yeah. Sorry. I know he's a great person to learn from, right? I, I learned it from a bunch of people. So <laughs> yep. there you go. Check out Bernie's book, Loving Our Students on Purpose. And we're going to have a lots of information for you to where to get that. Um, Bernie, thanks again. We're so enjoy having you on the show. And thank you so much for listening. And we'll see and you next getting time. Getting up so early. And getting up so early. Yes, Bernie <laughs> wins for that one. <laughs> she does. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you, Danny, for writing this book. It's been such an honor. Well, thanks for joining us on The Kylie Show, and we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thanks for listening. Never miss an episode of The Kylo Show by subscribing to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or watch us on the Loving on Purpose YouTube channel. Don't forget to submit your questions and testimonies to thekyloshow.com. The Kylo Show is produced by Ali Armading, co-produced by Ashley Beck and Anna Hill, sound engineer and edited by Taylor Silk, and show promoter Christian Zamora. Don't forget, whole healthy families, gonna save the world.